This newborn baby is being footprinted to prevent it being stolen. Our fee here is, is 10,000 US dollars. This but man is offering a baby to a British couple. What he doesn't know is that they're from World in Action. Around the world, hundreds of babies have been stolen and then adopted by unwitting parents. This woman's baby was stolen last year. In an undercover investigation, World in Action tackles the baby broker. Monday, 8.30 on ITV. You're watching Granada as we join ITN now for the news. Good evening. This is the news from ITN. Tonight's headlines. The Northern Ireland Secretary admits contacts with the IRA go back years, not months. Sinn Féin says government contacts were authorised by the Prime Minister and some Cabinet colleagues knew. And three men charged over the killing of London policeman Patrick Dunn. They're due in court in the morning. The government says it's been in contact with the IRA for years, not just months. Downing Street defended that, saying it would have been irresponsible to ignore the IRA's overtures about ending violence. According to Sinn Féin, the Prime Minister personally authorised these contacts and several cabinet ministers knew about them. The Northern Ireland Secretary, Sir Patrick Mayhew, will make a statement in the Commons tomorrow. Negotiations, no. Talks, no. But contacts, yes. In the end, the playing with words has had to stop. An embarrassed Northern Ireland Secretary admitted today that the IRA had been in contact with him and he with them. That came by a channel or chain of communication that has been in place for some years. And that channel of communication has been the means of communicating in each direction messages, the value of the chain being that it is confidential. But Sir Patrick's problem is that in the public's eyes, today's admission hardly appears to square with his previous remarks about not talking to the IRA. Nobody has been authorised to, uh, or to talk or to negotiate on behalf of the government with Sinn Féin or with any other terrorist organisation. This, we now know, is how things have gone. In 1990, contacts, Sinn Féin say a face-to-face -face meeting, began and continued into 1992. In February this year, an IRA message told the government the conflict is over and asked what to do next. On March the 22nd, two days after the Warrington bomb, Sir Patrick Mayhew sent back a verbal and written message telling the IRA to end this violence. In July, according to Sinn Féin, face-to-face -face contact ended, but messages still went back and forth. Indeed, as late as the first week of November, Sir Patrick has confirmed, messages were still being exchanged. But he still angrily insisted today that no one had been talking, as he uses the term, to the IRA. And let it be known what the context of all this is, for goodness sake. Is there a price being offered to the IRA by the British government? That is the context, and nothing of that kind has taken place at all. But Labour's Kevin McNamara says government stupidity has jeopardised the whole peace process. And that is a criminal, in fact, or one would almost say a sinful thing to have done. And Paddy Ashdown said the Prime Minister must now table his own peace proposals because his initiative won't work without trust. He must act, and he must act soon, to restore that trust and replace and repair his own credibility. In the Commons tomorrow, when Sir Patrick Mayhew makes his statement, the government is likely to come under opposition attack, not just for being economical with the truth, but for playing a difficult hand badly and of being too fearful of the unionist backlash to admit what was really going on before now. Michael Brunson, ITN, Westminster. In Northern Ireland, the unionists have demanded the resignation of both the Prime Minister and the Northern Ireland Secretary. Ian Paisley accused them of deliberate, barefaced lying. Our chief political correspondent, Glyn Mathias, is in Belfast and has been assessing the reaction from both sides of the sectarian divide. The revelations about the government's contacts with the IRA have endangered the peace process and damaged the government's credibility. Sinn Féin were making the most of it. Gerry Adams said the Northern Ireland Secretary was telling lies from beginning to end. Because of the government ban, we can't broadcast his voice. He claimed it was the government, not the IRA, which had made the approach last February. It was authorised, he said, by John Major, with the knowledge of other cabinet ministers. There'd been no communication from the IRA that the conflict was over. 
John Hume of the SDLP was concerned the peace process should not be derailed. I think that the revelations, if they are revelations, underline what I have been saying consistently, that there is the best hope of peace in 20 years. But the Democratic Unionists call for the resignations of Sir Patrick Mayhew and of John Major. One of their MPs knew already about the secret contacts when they met the Prime Minister last week. I was wanting him to say something, and I was seeking and endeavouring him to say something that uh, would uh, prove that he was going to tell us exactly what was happening so it could allay some of the fears that certainly were in my own heart. Unfortunately, that was not so. The response from the larger of the Unionist parties has been more measured. Unless there are further revelations, it seems unlikely that the Ulster Unionists will break off their support for the government in the Commons, upon which the Prime Minister has come to rely. Glyn Matthias, ITN, Belfast. Three men will appear in court tomorrow charged over the murder of community policeman Patrick Dunn. PC Dunn was shot dead in a London street last month. He was answering a routine call when he stumbled on an armed attack on a suspected drug dealer. One of the three men who's been arrested is charged with murdering PC Dunn and the suspected drug dealer. Former Chancellor Norman Lamont has warned his successor, Kenneth Clark, not to impose hefty tax increases in his budget on Tuesday. Mr. Lamont said large increases would involve high political and economic risks. However, there are indications that Mr. Clark's tough stand on public spending may have reduced the big need for taxes. The Chancellor was the main attraction at his local Tory party weekend Christmas fair, but he wasn't giving anything away about what's in the budget. City economists, though, now believe it won't be as tough as had been thought. I think he's going to announce some small tax increases, but the big surprise will be that he'll actually announce some spending cuts and the combination ought to give the market some confidence that he'll be bringing the deficit down. Lower inflation, currently benefiting shoppers, could be the key to those spending cuts. The Chancellor may argue that government departments, like the Ministry of Defence, don't need so much money because prices for them too are being curbed. Meanwhile, Labour are warning that VAT increases announced in the last budget are still in the pipeline, in addition to any further tax rises for Mr Clark. He will neither abandon VAT on fuel, which is causing so many pensioners so many problems, uh, nor will he attempt to build the British economy with the investment, jobs and industry measures we need. The previous Chancellor who brought in VAT on fuel is warning Mr Clark against too big a compensation package to help the less well off. Every day we get these demands for money, 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 more on this, more on that. The government's greatest problem is controlling spending, and so I hope that the package will not be over generous. The drinks industry also has a plea for Mr. Clark. They're hoping he won't put up duty, at least not until after Christmas. In the rest of today's news, forensic experts are investigating fires at 12 farms in Kent, all within a few hours of each other. It's thought the fires were started deliberately. They all happened around the Ashford area of Kent and caused hundreds of thousands of pounds in damage. An escaped prisoner who hired a plane in Hampshire and flew across the Channel has been captured in Paris. Graham Jones was on home leave from Send Prison in Surrey. The comedy actor Kenneth Connor has died of cancer at the age of 74. He'll be best remembered for his carry-on films. More recently, he played in television's Allo Allo. A British trade union delegation tonight called on holidaymakers to boycott Turkey in protest at what it called the systematic persecution of Kurds in the country. The trade unionists returned home after being held by police in Turkey for more than 24 hours. They arrived back at Heathrow Airport to a welcome from Kurdish activists. But in the news conference that followed, the strain of the last few days came to the surface. The party of trade unionists say they were held for 27 hours by security forces in southeast Turkey. They claimed they were detained while trying to check reports that a Kurdish village had been destroyed by Turkish troops. People were there with tractors. The houses were, were torched. People had got what belongings they had left out of the houses. And there was just a pile outside the house. Yeah. All the time there were tractors there with the trailers and they were loading everything in so that the people could evacuate the villages. We could see the, the houses were still burning, um, there was like tractors that had been destroyed, it was just, you know, decimation that had happened. 
One man even produced a handful of ash taken, he claims, from the remains of a Kurdish village. The group say they'll now take their case to human rights organisations. And that's all from us this evening. From the weekend team, good night. Again, well, it's been rather settled and cold over many parts of the country over the last few days. But in a way, this is the calm before the storm as wet and very windy conditions move in from the west during tonight and tomorrow. We can see the reason for this if we move to tomorrow's wind flow chart. We have a series of weather fronts moving in from the Atlantic, packing these isobars tighter together. And what that means is we're going to have strengthening south easterly winds, also cloudy wet conditions. And with those winds, that's going to mean driving rain, perhaps some drifting sleet or snow over the Scottish Highlands and the Pennines for a time. But back to tonight, still some dry and cool conditions to come for central and eastern parts of the country. Widespread frost, perhaps some icy patches. Out in the west, though, thickening cloud and increasing wind, bringing outbreaks of rain to western Scotland, northern Ireland, western Wales, and down to the southwest of England. Now, that rain's going to push ahead across the country tomorrow, turning wintry in places as it does so, particularly in the east and over the Scottish Highlands and the Pennines, where there's likely to be some drifting in those strengthening southeasterly winds. Indeed, it's going to be quite windy in a lot of places tomorrow, but especially in the west and northwest, where there's likely to be gales or severe gales. That's about it from me. Here's tomorrow's summary. It could have been my child, and I thank God that it wasn't. And um, they've had no right to take my, my child out of that shop to wherever they were going to go. Tomorrow on GMTV, the anguish of the luckiest mum alive who saved her son from the clutches of Jamie Bulger's murderers.